Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to join this distinguished crowd and, and my colleagues here. Uh, congratulations to Shazna. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to chat with you all. I'm going to share some hopefully fun stuff, some examples of some of the visual trends that you've heard about from Shasna and uh, some tools that we might all benefit from in the coming year. All of the links that I'm going to mention are in this one link, bit.ly slash wonder tools, as well as the slides. So if you're interested in looking later at some of these things, you can take a look later. And my intention is not to get into great depth on any of these things, but to give you a kind of a sampler. It's a little bit of a, a, a taste of some different things that are out there. Uh, you can also ask questions. I put together a little interactive page. It's Slido. Maybe some of you have used it. And you can just type in slido.com on your phone or on your laptop or whatever device. Some people have tablets. And you can put in the code SCOOP. And then you can either ask a question and I can respond to it afterwards. Or you can suggest your own underrated app or resource or tool because you all have as much insight as, as uh, any of us up here on the stage. So feel free to share your own thoughts about some cool resource or trend or, or app or, or tool that you find useful and, and we can benefit from each other's insights together. This is uh, a picture of my two daughters. They're very excited that I get to talk about apps and sites and cool visual trends. We love exploring the amazing world that we're living in right now. I, I really do believe this is a golden age for visual journalism. You've seen Shazna's work and the work at the Wall Street Journal, and, and I'm sure the work we all see on a regular basis uh, nowadays makes us aware of the fact that we're really, really in this special, special moment. And I want to acknowledge the fact that it's a very difficult moment for journalism and for faith in journalism and for trust in journalism. But if we set that aside for a moment, when we think about visual journalism, it's really an incredible time to be alive and to be able to consume anything from anywhere in the world, virtually instantaneously, wherever we are, whenever we want to. That's a, an incredibly powerful opportunity that we have. And as creators, the opportunity to serve people beyond our narrow circles, outside of our city, outside of our country, outside of our continent, et cetera. How many people, by the way, are here from Hamburg? I'm sure a lot of people are here from Hamburg. And how many people, I'm curious, are here from outside of Hamburg, but in Germany, somewhere else in Germany? So a lot, a lot as well. And then how many people are here from abroad, from outside of Germany? We have a, 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 quite a number of those as well. So we all can connect, um, not only here in person, but, but through all of these amazing platforms and resources that we have digitally. So I'm going to share with you five trends. Um, this is the, the first one. And this is uh, right around the corner from us in New York City in Brooklyn. I took my students to visit this kind of secret laboratory where they're building a little bit of what you can see on the screen right now. Vimeo is also a New York company, and they're partnering with this amazing company that's making volumetric displays. They're better known as holograms, but they prefer the more technical term of volumetric display. And what I think is exciting about this is that they're starting to push past the early era of that technology and also to push past the early era of VR. So you heard about Nani Della Pena. She was here last year. And I think VR has tremendous potential. But thus far, in the early days of VR, we've been thinking about VR as that clunky cardboard thing right? that you try to stuff your phone into and never quite works. It's a little bit awkward. right? Many of us have probably had that experience. It's not quite an optimal user experience, despite the power of the technology. Right? It's a little bit like the early era of the cell phone when we had to have those gigantic, huge things that weighed you know, 10 pounds. Um, so I think we're moving past that initial early phase of, of VR. And now we're getting something that's a little bit more engaging, a little bit more powerful. We're still early on, um, but this is an example of what some of the volume, volumetric displays um, start to look like, where you actually, in some cases, stop feeling like there's uh, a technology there, and you can actually focus on the content itself, the actual visuals. And again, we're still early on. This is, these are still early devices, but they're far more realistic, um, impactful than any of the prior prototypes I've seen in the past. And this is collaborative international work. There's a lot of engineers working on this across countries. And it's reflective of this broader trend, that video is taking all of these different kinds of shapes. 
Um, this still image is from a, a New York Times video piece that broke down and analyzed a piece of music through a series of amazing visuals. And uh, just as you saw with some of the examples that Shazna showed, visuals can illuminate stories in so many interesting and fascinating ways. And I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface of that. Uh, you saw um, a, a, a clip from this, but I just want to emphasize how amazing it is to be able to take something as complex as the stock market with thousands and thousands of different companies and many different sectors and everything's going up and down, and in one image on your phone start to get a visceral sense of what's going up, what's going down. It's, it's really an amazing piece of work that takes something that people are really interested in on a daily basis and makes it useful and actionable. So I think this is a good example of, of actionable, useful AR that's not just a gimmick, but really provides some insight to somebody looking at the market and wanting to get a visual overview really quickly and easily. There's also some really interesting work being done by journalists who are saying, what if we add some transparency here? What if we let people see um, the process of kind of creating things? And, and kind of in the way that the Weather Channel sh um, created that amazing visual of the traumatic weather situation. This is an example from a, a, a really cool new team at NBC called NBC Left Field. And they're using Tilt Brush, which some of you may know is a tool from Google, which allows you essentially to paint on a screen. And they're combining that with a live sort of production such that they are actually telling a story using graphics that the journalist is creating in real time on the screen. Um, they did some post editing, but this is the kind of piece that they can now create in just a few hours and it really starts to be a game changer in terms of the kinds of visuals that they can create and the way they do it. Um, this is the, the tool they used, um, Google's Tilt Brush. Um, and there's a lot of new players in this. Facebook has a project called Quill, which is allowing journalists to create new kinds of illustrations and visualizations. And even Snapchat has you know, their own tool, and, and so on and on and on. Right? We'll probably have a, a similar kind of a tool coming from Apple, and we have a, a flourishing of tools that make this ever easier for ordinary journalists and independent journalists to create. This is a project from the USA Today Network. And this is a different kind of immersive journalism. So when we think about immersive journalism, um, sometimes we want to give the, the user the chance to actually control and, and look in different places. So this is an example of a story. Uh, it's about it's a, an investigative story based in Chicago. And Basically, as a user, it's a three-dimensional story using Sketchfab, and it allows you to actually travel through this space and move around in the space in a way that you don't need a VR headset, you don't need anything other than the screen and your own interest. Um, and it includes audio, and it's, it's really a powerful example of three-dimensional journalism. It's a kind of a different form of immersive journalism that, than, than the kinds we often hear about, which are the AR and the VR and the MR. Um, if you're interested in that specific topic, uh, there are a bunch of examples that we've collected um, at this link, bit.ly slash journo 3 d You can see a lots, lots of other ways organizations around the world are using this kind of three-dimensional storytelling in creative ways. The next trend I want to talk about is something I, I'm, I'm calling YouTube. And it's a, a kind of uh, a, 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 the idea that just like a lot of other journalism, we are engaging more directly with our audience, with our, with our communities. And uh, it, rather than just expecting people to sit back and watch, right? we expect people to engage and do something in some way. So some of these um, will be familiar to many of you. How many people use Twitch? So a few, a few. My guess is that in a couple of years, that number will increase. Right? Just as other um, video platforms have started to increase, you'll see an increase uh, of usage in that. This is an example of how the Washington Post used Twitch when uh, Mueller was on, uh, uh, on screen, and people were discussing and chatting in real time, responding to what he was saying in an engaging way. And again, we're just at the beginning of that era and that kind of usage, but the idea of using Twitch for journalistic purposes is, I think, going to take root, at least for certain kinds of stories and certain kinds of audiences. TikTok is the other big one um, that really allows everyone to kind of get in the game and create their own thing. It's reminiscent in my eyes of Vine. I don't know how many people remember Vine, the six second, yeah, a lot of people. Okay, so Vine was a pretty popular network for a while, right? Before the Twitter acquisition and then even early on in that period. And then it kind of died a sudden death, right? My view is Instagram basically killed Vine, the popularity and the growth of, of Instagram and its flexibility. Um, and so we may see a similar 
possible result with with TikTok, but I don't think it's quite the same. I think I think we're seeing some really interesting work with with TikTok, and they had 185 million new members um, last year. It's it's a huge growth story around the world that some of us who are maybe a little older than the typical TikTok user might be missing. But you may recall other social platforms that also started among younger users and then expanded and grew. And, and I think uh, it's an interesting one to watch. And just as they've experimented with Twitch, the Washington Post is one of the leading experimenters with TikTok, doing some really kind of funny and silly things, but trying to, again, reach new kinds of audiences. Shazna mentioned the Wall Street Journal reaching new audiences. There are various ways that a lot of these media organizations are reaching out to new communities that maybe don't realize that their publication has a lot to offer. So it's kind of an entry point, and then they can provide some really great content after that. Another kind of immersive, but also interactive trend, this one I'm super, super fascinated by, because the idea is you can control the story. So when you watch a cooking um, video, the person typically is cooking whatever they were planning to cook, right? Whether you like that or not, right? What they're doing here with this platform called Echo, and BuzzFeed is a big user of this, is they're allowing you, the user, to customize what the recipe you want to see is. So are you creating this, cooking this yourself for one person? Um, do you have a preference as to whether you want this to be a sweet potato recipe or a Yukon gold potato recipe? And on and on. It's really, it's quite robust. And you can imagine that they're quite thoughtful about how they have to film this, such that they have a video ready no matter what combination of selections you've made. But it's, it's the first example I've seen of a really smart, sort of personalized video that uh, users can customize in a really interactive way and just flows seamlessly and logically. And then you get your recipe, and then you can see the, the video of this person making exactly what you've selected. So there's a, a variety of different use cases that Echo has, um, has started with, including various clothing and fashion kinds of things where people can see different outfits, et cetera. And you can imagine for service journalism, there's a real benefit to allowing the user to interact and, and customize, personalize what they're doing. The next trend is a pretty quick one. You do see a bunch of people here who are fantastic photographers, I'm sure, using powerful, impressive, strong DSLR cameras that do an incredible job of taking wonderful pictures. However, for the 99% of other people who are not professional photographers or very dedicated serious photographers, I think we're going to see a diminishment of the DSLR as the primary photographic tool because of the nature of the new iPhone and other phones like it and the power of the machine learning that's on board those devices. So it's not just the combination of, of lenses. It's the software that basically allows the phone itself in real time to analyze and improve and change and adjust to lighting and do all of these amazing things without us even noticing. So I think we're going to see less and less usage of DSLR and more and more incredible experimentation among amateurs, but also among professional journalists. The New York Times had a journalist a couple of years ago who won an award with photographs he took on his iPhone in war zones because it was much easier for people to just act normally right around an iPhone. And so that trend is not brand new, but the acceleration of that trend is what we'll see now with the new generation of phone cameras. This next one is a little bit different. Um, it's not really about traditional visuals in the way that we think about them. It's about documents. So documents are something we work with all the time as journalists and in whatever information profession you might be in. And uh, for a long time, documents are basically text on a page, right? Um, occasionally, people are inserting charts, but it's, they're not really built for that. And I think one of the really exciting trends at the moment um, is for this idea of visual documents to, to, um, to arise. So there's a bunch of different platforms that are growing like crazy. Um, one of them is called Notion, which basically, it's, it's, it, it's similar to something like Word or Microsoft Word or Google Docs or other documents you've used. But instead of just being confined to basically text and then sort of trying to figure out a way to clunkily insert an image, it's built for all kinds of different material to live on the same page. And this has a number of different use cases just for us as journalists or professionals just to use in our own workflow. But it also has a use case for us as journalists in the, in the realm of journalism transparency. So it's my view that it's really important for us as journalists to show the public the work that we do so they see the validity of the reporting that we've conducted and the information we've gathered and to show them the data behind our stories, to show them the evidence behind the stories. 
and with these tools, and I'll show you a few of them, these are ways of essentially creating really robust interactive ways of showing people what our work is. And these can be um, embedded within stories, they can be um, set aside a story as a supplementary material, et cetera. Um, Airtable is one specifically for kind of um, spreadsheet-like data or database-like data. It's a really incredibly powerful resource for presenting database information or complex spreadsheet information in a beautifully visual way that anyone can understand and interact with and customize. So you don't need to be a professional data visualization artist or database manager or anything like that, but you can create a really complex set of, set of data. And then any user of your news organization, any reader, can essentially interact and customize and choose filters. They just want to see the data from Hamburg or from whatever city they're in. Um, Milanote is another one which is it's kind of like a Pinterest idea. It's, a, it's basically organizing the information purely visually. But it's really an elegant resource, and again, I think a way for, for, for us as journalists to, to, to rethink how we show things internally, and also how we present some of our, our work and evidence to the public. Coda is one other one. These are all really fast-growing platforms that are taking seed um, uh, in, in various countries around the world. And Coda um, has basically, as you can see, it's, it's, it allows you to actually create interactions. So you can create buttons that people can press within the document that will then open up a particular spreadsheet or a particular visual or will filter out certain kinds of data. It allows you to create an interactive uh, resource for your readers really, really pretty quickly and easily. Um, and one of the things about these things is that you can spin them up on the moment, at the moment. So you know, there's breaking news constantly, and we don't always have time to have a visual team spend a week preparing a great visualization. So with these kinds of tools, you could actually spin something up in just a couple of hours, and people can be interacting with it, adding to it, editing it, improving upon it, um, in including any reporter. Uh, and this is one for those of you who are interested in sort of security and, and kind of privacy, because some of these others have um, more open uh, setups. Arcane Office is a, is a much more kind of um, uh, privacy-focused version of the, of the other um, ones that I've just mentioned. Uh, this trend I won't say a lot about, but I'll just play a little video for you. I am glad to be here with you in Hamburg. I am a stable genius, and I speak nearly perfect German. So uh, I, I think we've all sort of started to hear about this kind of stuff and seen this here and there. I think this year, to 20, when I say this year, I mean the year ahead, 2020, I think this is going to be the year where it really becomes an issue for, for uh, consumers, where they're faced with situations they have to figure out if something's real or not. We really haven't had a lot of those situations arise yet. Um, our President Trump s started to claim at one point that he didn't act. He wasn't actually the voice on that video, on that uh, recording uh, about how he grabbed women. But people kind of dismissed that um, because it just seemed ludicrous on its face. But I think in 2020, my expectation is we will see cases where there's a little bit more ambiguity and people really aren't sure if it's fake or not. Um, here's one more example. It is such an honor to join you in the audience here today for Scoop Camp in my favorite German city, Hamburg. So this is something that um, you can do in a couple seconds, right, on a free website. And you can imagine if it's that easy to do it that quickly, at a reasonable level of quality, you can judge for yourself how faithful to those two voices you think those examples are. But if it's that easy to do it that quickly, you can imagine a, what a professional seeking to undermine a particular candidate or to do whatever wreak whatever havoc they want to wreak, that you can imagine the damage they might be able to do. Uh, there's two specific ways to, to, to do this. That's the tool I used for the ones you just saw if you're interested in trying that out. Um, Voice.headliner app allows you to do that um, really quickly and easily for a number of voices. You can do Conway West. You can do, I don't know, a bunch of others that, if you're interested. Um, and in this, this one, I won't show you this right now, but I've actually been training my own model, which anyone can do for free as a way of just seeing how this works. Right? We have to understand how this works if we want to be able to uh, address it and, and um, address these issues. So you can actually train your own model, essentially, for your own voice. So now it can simulate my voice. Um, because I've, I've read a certain number of words into this model. And again, this is a, a becoming a very simple and, and standard process for somebody, anyone wishing to um, basically create synthetic media, otherwise known as algorithmic propaganda, by the way. Um, and you heard the quote earlier about algorithms are not necessarily aiming for truth. In many cases, they're aiming specifically not for truth. Um, 
one of the things I want to mention in, in, with regard to these trends as we move on to some tools now is that I, I don't think any one of these things is really the solution, right? We hear a lot of interest in sort of golden tickets and silver bullets and all that stuff. And I think we've seen over the past decade or so a lot of efforts to crown the iPad as the future of journalism, right? Steve Jobs had the iPad on stage saying this is really going to change journalism. And we in the industry really bought into that whole scale. Uh, and very few people, I would say, rely on the iPad today to read their news regularly, right, as the primary device. Uh, and we look to instant articles for that from Facebook. We look to Facebook Live. Numer numerous companies really bet on Facebook Live and instant articles. We've talked a lot about virtual reality. Some news organizations, which will not be named, spent millions and millions of dollars establishing um, big units to, to do a lot of virtual reality really early on. And on the one hand, I think that can be a very wise investment because it, it's important to be ahead of the curve. But on the other hand, uh, in some cases, uh, the interest really faded quickly and, 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 and I think was a bit too early. So, um, so I think the, the important thing to keep in mind with all of these trends is that they make incremental, they add incremental benefits to the storytelling that we do, but I don't think we should rely on any of these individual things as really saving uh, journalism. I think we have to focus on incremental innovation in the way we create products, in the way we structure our organizations, so they're diverse organizations, in the way that we do our reporting. So doing reporting in innovative ways along the lines of what you heard from, from Shasta. So I want to share with you just some stuff to try, stuff that you might find interesting, stuff that I find inspiring and cool and fun and useful. And some of this um, can be used for journalistic purposes. Some of it can be used for personal purposes. Um, this is an example of an app that's, that's uh, been a favorite of mine. It's called Waterlog. How many people have used this app or very few of you, okay. And how many people have used a similar photo illustration app? The, the concept here is you take a photo. We all have hundreds if not thousands of photos on our phones, but how many of those photos do we actually feel we would be proud to show or share or use on social media? Relatively small fraction, typically. So what Waterlog does, it takes very simple, ordinary photos and turns them into works of art. And there's a number of other apps that do that, and I encourage you to experiment and explore ways that that can add variety, visual variety to your storytelling. This is an example of some ordinary photos that become a little bit less ordinary, I think. Um, it's not that they become masterpieces, but they become things that are kind of thumb stoppers, as we say. If somebody's scrolling through social media and they see something a little different, it adds a little visual variety that uh, is compelling for users as a, as a variant to the typical photo they're seeing. Um, this company, by the way, um, has it, it, it's a Brooklyn-based company um, called Tin Rocket, and they have a bunch of these kinds of different approaches. Percolate, you see a different style of visual. But the idea here basically is that we can think beyond the static image and, and think creatively about the kinds of visuals we share um, in a variety of different ways. This is one that allows you to create photo art that, and that also includes a, a video component, so you can use this for short videos as well. And, and they each have a slightly different style but they're all super easy to use and trivial um, for creating images. This one I like just because of the, the mixture of, of colors. It's called Pops of Color. Um, this is a plug for a tool that is just a very simple tool. It's a very ordinary tool. Um, I know various people have different feelings about Google. We can set aside uh, that for, for the moment just to say that, that in terms of the, the single best way to back up photos and to share photos and to organize photo albums, this to me has been an invaluable resource. This one is called This, which if you're naming an app, I encourage you not to name something This <laughs> for reasons that are probably obvious, but try searching for it. So um, you have to search this by Tin Rocket. And what they did was something very simple, which is take really complicated images and make them really simple to annotate. So any kind of image that you want to annotate, you can actually simply draw a couple of little lines, text. The text um, responds to whether it's white or black on the background, adjusts accordingly. And just a very simple tool for doing something that we can certainly do with professional tools, but sometimes you just want to do something like that really quickly. And it uh, turns out that it comes in handy in a lot of different kinds of scenarios for annotating images where you have multiple things in the same picture. If I were taking a picture of you all right now, I could pull out certain people, certain people that I recognize, and, and, and then share that to social media, for example. You can test that out. Adobe has a suite which is remarkably easier than their professional suite. So many of you may be familiar with the Adobe professional suite. 
um, which includes Premiere and um, Audition and InDesign and so forth. And this is the opposite. This is for people who are not professional designers. It's completely free and it's completely fast and easy and it, yet it's quite powerful. So there's three parts to this suite. One is the Spark Post, which is for creating simple images. There's a Spark Video, where you can create one minute videos, two minute videos, very, very easily, very powerfully, and uh, for free. And there's Adobe Spark Page, where you can create a micro site. Let's say you wanted to spin up a site covering some highlights from today's conference to share with a colleague or friends or team. You could spin up a quick site using Adobe Spark Page, include highlights, embed some in images, videos, text, PDF, whatever you want, um, in a matter of a few minutes, if you wanted to. This is one I like using for sharing visual images of text. So there are quotes, there's some great quotes I've heard already this morning, and to share those quotes, I can grab um, some text, um, online text, and share it to, uh, to Twitter. These are examples of what that, what that looks like. This is one for a conference like this one. This is actually uh, the DPA um, handle, and basically just grab the handle or hashtag that you wanna show, and it creates, it creates a very quick, a quick uh, word cloud a tweet cloud out of that. So it's a, it's a way to summarize all of the stuff that's floating through Twitter in a quick, in a quick little second. Useful for an event. Sometimes we want to show visuals and graphics, um, but we don't have our computer at hand or we want to do something really quickly. So this is just an example of how a tool that allows you to do this on your phone. And you're not going to do this to create really super complicated graphics, but if you have a, a, a couple of quick stats, um, for example, 8% of people in Germany pay for news, right? That's a stat from the Reuters Digital News Report 2019. And you have um, a couple of other stats, countries you want to compare that to. Uh, you could create a quick little chart using this um, tool to share to social media. So you're not just sharing text or a number, you're sharing an actual little, little visual. Another stat that I found interesting from that report, by the way, for those of you who haven't read it, 70% uh, of those Germans who pay for news pay for one particular publication digitally. So only 30% pay for two or more. So as we discussed with some students recently, it's kind of an all or nothing game at the moment, although that may change. But if you wanted to create charts about that, you could create them simply with some of these tools. Uh, this is one I love. Um, I'm showing my older daughter this as she's beginning to learn some math. You just point it at a math equation and it shows you on your screen. So it's a little AR, augmented reality application for a very simple task, but quite fun and shows um, creative use of the technology. It's called PhotoMath. A uh, couple of apps I use for video. I'll show you a, a, a few different apps for video right now. And this is one now owned by GoPro and it's free to use. And the concept is you have videos on your phone that are just going to sit there and probably no one's ever going to see them. You may not ever even look at them again. You also have lots of photos, right? Most people in this room, I would guess, have hundreds if not thousands of photos and videos sitting on their phone that will never be seen by any other human. And it's not because there's not interesting things there. It's just because it's a little bit of a nuisance, a task. You're not used to photo editing or video editing every day. And it's just there's enough friction that you just won't bother, even if you know how to do it. So the concept behind Quick and a couple of other tools like it is basically you just pick out a bunch of photos based on the thumbnails and videos, and it creates it, automatically creates an algorithmic video for you. And the surprising thing, the noteworthy thing, is that they're actually really good. They're actually um, quite good, and, and, and you can customize them. So you can do some editing, but the whole process can be done in a matter of a few minutes. And once you start doing it, you share it with someone, they have no idea what tool you used, and they just think, wow, that's an interesting thing. So if I were creating a video of this event, just my experience here, probably not something I'm gonna spend several hours creating, just because I don't have a need to do that, but I might spend five minutes doing it, or 10 minutes doing it, and that, that's, that's the, the, the use case where it's, it's valuable. Magisto is a similar version. It's a Coke and Pepsi kind of thing. Magisto is a similar kind of app, um, both free. Apple Clips is one that's really underrated. Um, people don't really uh, seem to use it, know about it. It does some amazing things. You can narrate a, a video, and it will actually convert your narration to text and create basically the lower thirds automatically. Um, it does some amazing algorithmic stuff with um, creating photo and live photo and video illustrations. So those of you who have an iPhone, I encourage you to, to test that out. Anchor does something magic for audio. So there's a growing interest in audio and, and creating 
audio podcast. Manker makes it free for anyone to create a podcast and distribute it around the world. And it also allows you to create audio that's then shown as a video. So it's hard to share um, audio to Facebook or Twitter, et cetera. But Anchor lets you create a, a video out of your audio that you can then share to social platforms for free. Wibbits is a really interesting platform for news organizations. It's one of the fastest growing video platforms used by news organizations in the US. And essentially, they do algorithmic video, but for news, uh, professional news organizations. So they take existing assets from the AP and other news agencies, including photos and videos, and they match it to stories that news organizations are interested in telling, and they essentially create a professional-looking algorithmic video in a matter of minutes that the editor can then edit and refine and adjust. But it, what it does is allow news organizations to produce far more videos than they have in the past for those that are interested in volume. Right? It's not necessarily going to produce the highest quality video, but for some news organizations, they want videos to accompany more of their stories. This is a tool they can use, and they are using um, increasingly. A couple of final graphics tools. Um, Flourish is an amazing tool for creating all kinds of data visualizations that used to be uh, exclusive to really professional um, designers. And now you can basically use a simple template for free and create really powerful visuals, even if you've never done it before. This is a, a personal favorite of mine, Tilda. It actually is very similar to Squarespace. It's a simple website builder, but it actually makes the act of building a site really easy and beautiful and fun, and you can use it for free to try it out. Um, and I've personally found it super useful, and I found that most people don't know about it. So it's a recommendation of mine. These are some examples of the kinds of themes, but there's a lot of really, really nice templates and allows you to create really beautiful visuals. Last couple ones. This is actually from a German company called Context Lab. And they have a beautiful system for creating a map, a story that's, a, that's visualized on a map. So this is an example of one that I've been building about entrepreneurial journalism. And it allows you to basically take a, uh, a, a series of information points and videos and connect them together in, in kind of interesting ways. So here's what it looks like when you're interacting with it. You can sort of explore different levels of a map. So you can imagine you have a complicated set of information. It allows you to create simple visuals, text, photos, video, that people can explore in a, in a really comfortable, easy way. So um, plot it to them um, for, for building Context Lab. This is for social media curation. So if you want to pull together tweets and Instagram um, images and YouTube videos and tell a story that's curated, this is a fantastic tool for that. There used to be a tool called Storify. Um, which was created by, I think, the first Scoop Camp Award winner, uh, Bert Herman, but that, unfortunately, is no longer with us. So Wakelet has taken its place, and again, it's a great way. It's kind of like a scrap, scrapbook of social media. If you wanted to pull all the great tweets from Scoop Camp today or whatever event, INMA, or whatever the, the conference you're at is, you can pull them together on one page or on a particular theme and create a, a way to visualize all of the social content and material around a story. This one is brand new. It's from a company called Typeform, which makes forms, much better, beautiful forms for your readers or your audience or your customers or whoever to fill out. And the newest thing they've offered, which is brand new, it's in beta, I've just been testing it, is called Conversations. So it takes a, a form that someone would normally fill out and it turns it into a dialogue. So it's actually like a bot that they're interacting with as opposed to filling out a boring form. They're actually answering questions and you know, um, responding to things as if they were talking in a chat in a WhatsApp message, for example. It's really, you've got to see it to see the, the feel of it, but it's really a, a powerful tool. And you don't have to do anything other than create the form, create the questions, and it automatically does this for you. Um, this is an email tool that allows you to vi add visuals to email. Every single person in this room, I'm guessing, will use email today. It's probably the only platform that every single person will use, I'm guessing, in this room. And there, there are very few tools that really allow you to make email more beautiful. And, and Mixmax is a, is, a, is a cool and useful tool, in my, in my view, to embed video and PDFs and all kinds of other visuals into, into email. Um, this is a wonderful free tool from the Night Lab at Northwestern in Chicago to allow you to create timelines that are visual, super easy, super fast. And, um, and this is a 3D timeline tool called BDocs that allows you to create a, a timeline that allows people to move through a story in a three-dimensional way. It's really beautiful. So there are lots and lots of things to choose from. This is my favorite ice cream store in New York. If you ever come to New York City, you should visit Morgan Stearns. It's amazing. They have 88 flavors. My younger daughter asks me to read every single one when we go there. 
and then she chooses vanilla. <laughs> and my point in showing you this is that there's lots and lots of tools to create amazing, powerful, gorgeous visuals that are really fun to make and engaging for your community, your audience. But you don't have to worry about ADA. So my encouragement, my, my request for you is just to kind of try one, try something new, and create a new kind of visual. This should not be the realm of the you know, visual editors or the most powerful kind of video people or photo people. It should be the realm of everyone. We can all do this. And I encourage you to, to explore and have fun with it. Um, it's a blast. It is super, super exciting and fun. And uh, again, if you have your own to share, I know many people in this room have other favorites um, that you can add to, to our list collectively. Um, you can also email me. Um, to share your, your input, jeremy at jeremykaplan.com, or you can put them on the Slido. And oh, there's my email. And thank you very much for your time and attention and interest, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, enjoy the rest of the, the day. Thank you. <laughs>